Well, I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring as an influencer to tell you how to build a raised bed. I'm not saying it means much. I have a Bachelor of Science in Soil Science. I've been working in the world of agriculture for a decade, and I've been gardening since I was five years old with my grandma. By gardening, I mean five-year-old Ashley's garden was mostly survival of the fittest. I'm a redhead, and so survival of the fittest for anyone in my life is definitely a thing. You can ask any of my ex-boyfriends. Gotta make it through some pain to get the gain of my presence and my glory. And so with that being said, we are gonna apply a little bit of science into what I choose to put in my race beds and why. First off, let's start with kitchen scraps. So I think the popular ones are gonna be coffee grounds, bananas, and eggshells, but this rule applies to all kitchen scraps of all shapes and sizes. So it's one thing to have filler in the bottom of the bed that come in the shape and form of compost, aged compost, leaves, logs, or nothing at all, which is actually what I did with the four beds out there. And all of these perform very similar because there wasn't any excessive rot or moisture in any of these, and they all provided some aeration and therefore the interface between the soil and what that medium is not that big of a deal but when we're talking kitchen scraps the dynamics change a little bit two big things that happen number one is the dynamic of nitrogen and number two is actually the dynamic of microbes so nitrogen is the same issue we see with mulch and it's the same issue we see when we put logs or cardboard or leaves underneath soil if your plant root do come in contact with that interface or a bulk of the roots do there is going to be a lack of nitrogen and so therefore the only way to counter that issue is through adding more nitrogen on and more specifically i would use a synthetic nitrogen over an organic nitrogen because you need really immediate nitrogen in order to kind of offset the fact that the microbes are pulling so much nitrogen to help decompose the wood the leaves the kitchen scraps the cardboard you name it. So that one is correctable if you chose to go that route and you just would have corrected by adding more nitrogen. But what about when it comes to decomposition? So this actually isn't so easily corrected, particularly the diversity and the mix of microbes. So microbes will change depending on their environment. When we talk about plant roots and the space around the plant roots, soil, plant roots, water, air, all of it, there is something called the rhizosphere. And this rhizosphere sphere is basically the planet earth that is home to the microbe that help with mineralization and mobilization of nutrients so this isn't necessarily heavy decomposers doing the work it is microbes that are responsible for for example nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria so it is the stage in decomposition or nutrient processing that is way beyond way beyond decomposition and composting and we want those microbes there we want them to do that job however when we throw in a lot of kitchen scraps and we have to invite a lot of actual decomposers to come in and break up big bits into little bits before the rest of these guys can do the rest of their work it throws the balance off and we want to try to avoid that as much as possible particularly when we're talking lower levels of the soil it's a known fact in the world of soil science that the microbe distribution and the types that of microbes that exist throughout the soil profile change based on the depth so typically mother nature a lot of the decomposers are on that surface the reason being banana trees aren't growing limbs digging holes and putting the bananas inside of them to decompose it's not the case we know this they just drop to the soil surface and then that's where it decomposes so because of that we find a lot of these decomposers macro and micro on that soil surface and that's what nature intended as you get lower in the soil profile you start losing oxygen and you start losing light and a number of different factors all of which shockingly enough contribute to the volume and the number of decomposers that can be present so the lower portions of the profile will have just typically naturally less decomposers because of the lack of light the lack of oxygen and just overall the environment the microclimate that is the surface versus several inches down so when this happens we end up with slower decomposition and this slower decomposition translates into more sludge and more sludge translates into poor root health potentially a change in ph to the negative because of ammonia buildup. Worst case scenario, an attractive smorgasbord 
for things like mice and voles and critters because things like eggs, for example, those guys will love that. And if you literally are just putting it right in the bottom of a raised bed where they can absolutely devour it, they will. And they will then destroy your plants. So kitchen scraps best served in the compost, decomposed and then considered to be added to the raised bed setup, which actually is a great segue into the next one that you don't want to necessarily add to your raised bed and that is straight compost or manure or vermicast. So here's the thing, it looks great. It looks beautiful to have a potting soil, a compost, a manure, a vermicast soil solely made of those components. It is rich, it is fluffy, it is light to begin with, but it goes downhill very quickly. Turns out plants need not just nutrients, they need structure, minerals, and oxygen. Have you ever heard of the product called rock dust? Have you ever seen the price tag on rock dust? Well, I'm gonna let you in on a little hint. Rock dust is literally soil because soil is rock. So if you're using things that don't have soil in them, you're gonna run into micronutrient deficiencies, for example. So one way to kind of curb that is to use mostly soil. And the other way to kind of get good soil structure and not a big blob is via, again, actual soil. When we use compost, peats, manures, all of these, we have to add perlite, we have to add pumice, we have to add something structurally, a mineral of some sort, a rock at one point into the mix in order to encourage oxygen and structure because we need that for roots, we need that for microbes. And the organic setup, purely organic setups, and by organic I mean at one point living, it doesn't give us what we need. So here are the four kind of big things. Compaction, nutrient imbalances, because of excessive levels of certain nutrients, it will affect the uptake of other nutrients. And let's face it, compost or manure, it's really hard to say what balance they have or what the composition is because it's going to change based on every single batch. Next is drainage issues. This is again the compaction portion playing in but just in general it just isn't going to drain properly. And then we have salt built up. This is particularly true with manures but it can happen with the actual compost itself. When we think fertilizer and salt we usually think synthetics only. Well just an FYI the nutrient format that plants uptake nutrients in in many cases is a salt not table salt proper but a salt in the world of chemistry and so because of that in excess it can cause burning and that can happen for organic and it can happen for synthetic. So a 2022 meta-analysis found that over 60% had a nutrient overload. So the moral of the story here when it comes to compost, manures, vermicast, it's an ingredient. It is not the substrate. You want to use a blend. This blend can be anywhere from 30 to 50% by volume compost the remainder being mineral soil, ideally a loam soil. If you get a high quality top soil, so if you're going for a bag soil, if it's a high quality top soil, that is going to be a loam. All you need to do is add that $2 bag of top soil with the compost and voila, you're good to go. But again, you wanna go for higher quality. If you can't get your hands on quite higher quality, you can go for a garden blend or a garden mix or a triple mix. All of these is basically referencing something that already has mineral soil, a loam soil, mixed with a compost. So it's very important to realize that there's already compost in there. So you may not wanna add more or or what you do add needs to be conservative in nature because it's already blended into the mix. You do get bonus points though if you choose to screen your compost prior to applying it because the finer the material, the better off you will be. Number three, the use of landscape fabric. You're thinking, because I've thought this too, put landscape fabric on the bottom to help reduce the loss of soil out through the raised bed, but it causes a lot of problems. I've actually made this mistake mistake before and I very quickly realized it as a mistake within the first year. It was almost immediate I knew I'd fucked up basically. Number one, it actually 
prevents the roots from being able to penetrate downwards. So if your raised beds are on top of a soil, on top of a lawn, the penetration of the roots into those lower soil systems is a good thing, particularly when we're talking droughts or reaching for nutrients. We don't want to prevent that. And in some cases, some landscape fabrics will prevent them from being able to do that. After all, they are there for preventing weeds from getting through. It's going to prevent your plants as well. Number two, is it actually affects the hydrology of the system as a whole. So I've spoken about perched water tables and a perched water table will happen in the event you have a landscape fabric or actually an event that you put your raised bed on top of an already compacted soil. You'll get very similar effect. This isn't a good thing in the shorter beds because it will cause root rot solely because that space will be anaerobic in and around there every time it decides to perch. Now the other issue here is actually the fact that if it does doesn't have access to those lower levels, it's much more difficult to actually keep those beds hydrated in the event you have a drought season or a very warm space, which I actually do have in some cases. And so because of that, I do notice if I have an interference between the bottom layer and the raised bed, those beds will dry out much quicker. And so the way to actually prevent that from happening is tilling up that bottom layer and then putting the bed on top. Ideal world, if you have to put it on top of cement, that is fine. Go ahead, do it. But just keep in mind, ideal world is on top of soil, particularly with the shorter ones. The other issue is actually the shared resources of microbial communities. Your native soil cannot communicate, for lack of a better term, with your raised bed soil. This will cause a difference in microbial communities. And in some cases, just because of the lack of water, the increased temperatures, maybe poor microbial contents in those upper layers. All three of these ideas seem natural or even smart, but they ignore exactly how soil systems actually work. Raised beds thrive when they are breathable, balanced, and biologically active setting. Not when you're just doing trends on the internet. Geek crew, you have to tell me in the comments the weirdest thing that you've added to a raised bed and why, whether or not it worked. And subscribe if you want more soil science-based facts from me, myself, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.